All right, welcome everyone to ASU's Interplanetary Initiative uh, virtual convening for the spring of 2021. I'm Lindy Elkins Tanton. I'm the Vice President for the Interplanetary Initiative. And uh, after a little bit of housekeeping, today we're going to start with an address from our President Michael Crow, followed by a couple of announcements. And then our keynote, Tracy Drain, Lead Systems Engineer at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. All right, so first, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is 50 minutes plus a 10 minute Q&A session at the end. Attendees are not seen and you're muted by default under this uh, webinar style. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to put in your questions and we'll be monitoring them and reading them out at the end in the Q&A session. Uh, but don't put them in the chat. The chat will not be seen by the presenters. And finally, attendees will all receive a webinar recording and a, sem and a survey when we're finished. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, a quick note, the Interplanetary Initiative mission. Our mission is to deploy new ways of building teams and solving problems at scale, partnered across disciplines and across sectors and across cultures to shape an inclusive and sustainable interplanetary future. Uh, and making these connections and bridges is one of our passions and that's part of what we're trying to achieve uh, with an event like today. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Michael Crow is an educator, a knowledge enterprise architect. Uh, he is a science and technology policy scholar and higher education leader. He became the 16th president of Arizona State University in July 2002, and he has spearheaded ASU's rapid transformation into one of the world's best public metropolitan research universities. And we're very happy to hear from Michael Crow today, uh, who is co-chair of our interplanetary initiative. Thank you, Lindy, and it's uh, great to not be able to see you, but to uh, know that you're out there. And uh, I don't really have what uh, Lindy called as an address. Uh, you know, I'm sitting here wearing my tracksuit in my office, you know, after uh, 15 months sitting here in my office. Uh, but what I do want to do is talk about uh, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so uh, a lot of people don't realize uh, when, when they think about universities, you know, what our role is. Um, William uh, Manchester wrote a book, A World Lit Only by Fire, years ago, in which he described the history of our species coming out of the uh, dark ages, uh, and at least in Europe, the role of the universities in helping to facilitate that emergence into uh, what ultimately became uh, uh, the, the Renaissance, what ultimately became the quest for reason, what ultimately became uh, uh, the enlightenment, uh, and all these things that, uh, that have made uh, progress, uh, uh, quote unquote, progress in the past. And so, I've become a, a, an unbelievable believer that universities are protectors of the future, that in addition to the role that we have to be uh, curators of, uh, of knowledge, uh, uh, teachers, uh, creators of uh, learning environments, uh, we are uh, uh, creators of new ideas and new theories, we are the protectors of the future. And so if you want a certain kind of future, a more just society, a more, a more uh, uh, equal justice system, if you want a better uh, outcome for our species, uh, there are many, many, many forces uh, that uh, don't produce those kinds of outcomes. And so if you're looking for uh, outcomes which will be the most successful for us uh, as a species, most, su most successful for us as a species on this particular planet, most successful for us as a species uh, beyond this planet, universities play this really, really important role. So at this university for the last 20 years, we have been uh, working to greatly uh, moderate uh, and modify our previous structure. And the reason is that we've done, as you can see by our response to the pandemic, a very mixed job, lots of scientific progress, lots of technological opportunity, lots of uh, uh, less social progress than we uh, could have used, uh, 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 greatly uh, reduced levels of, uh, of uh, of uh, scientific literacy across our population, or we would have achieved certain things within the pandemic by now that we haven't achieved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we've done a moderate job. And so two of the things that we've decided in addition to transforming the entirety of the intellectual design of the university, which we're deep into with 30 new transdisciplinary schools and institutes, uh, 80 colleges, schools, and institutes that we uh, moved away from and moved in new directions, the changing of our idea of the use of technology in the way that we operate the university and project our teaching and learning environment, the way in which we've decided not to just be a cloistered place where only A plus students from high schools and wealthy families come to gather around 
and uh, pontificate the future uh, with uh, you know uh, great faculty that they're engaged with only in small, isolated, ultra expensive classrooms uh, and, and in an ultra expensive environment. We've decided to modify the entire structure of the institution called a university. And in doing that, we selected two areas to lay the foundation for uh, uh, deep intellectual evolution. One is the constructing of a, a thing that we're thinking now of as a medical center for the earth that started as the global futures uh, initiative following some precursor work in our Institute of Sustainability and so forth and so on, and has now grown into the global futures laboratory. That is attempting, as I said, to construct the first medical center for the earth uh, with uh, many, many disciplines, hundreds of people, thousands of students, uh, hundreds of centers, all kinds of activities built on that model. And the second and even more challenging is the interplanetary initiative, which will ultimately grow into the interplanetary laboratory. Uh, and uh, that is what Lindy and her team is leading and moving forth with. And what we're after here is the laying of the intellectual track, the intellectual formation of a truly uh, interplanetary oriented group of scholars, thinkers, philosophers, economists, scientists, engineers, dreamers, writers, uh, everything imaginable, because we've got to get past the notion that it's all about sending out robots. We've got to get past the notion that it's all about somehow uh, we're going to live within the constraints of this single planet. We're not going to live within the constraints of this single planet because it's too constraining. We've got to take our species beyond the notion that we are somehow uh, 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 completely constrained and get everyone to understand that it's complete abundance. And once we understand that there's complete abundance, all the molecules, all the photons, all the energy, all the things that we need exist uh, beyond the planet, uh, then we're going to change our entire mindset. So Lindy has the very daunting task as Vice President for Interplanetary Planetary Initiatives at ASU to construct this intellectual realm, which people talk about and people dream about, but no one has constructed, as a part of uh, what will be the first university to step up and build uh, this basically protection of the future, which is to move us past the notion that all problems have to be solved within the fixed constrained system known as the earth. Because if so, we've already reached or nearly reached our limit, uh, uh, which is going to be very, very constraining for our species. And so Lindy has this daunting task. I appreciate everybody being here and uh, happy to help kick off this uh, very, very exciting uh, event. And Lindy, um, you know, we're, with Lindy and her team, you know, we have huge expectations that we will be constructing and building over time you know, the first interplanetary laboratory, which will not only be about science, but all things, philosophy, religion, economics, sociology, human development, human context, uh, psychological development, uh, everything that's going to take to become an interplanetary species. So, Lindy. Thank you very, very much, Michael. And that is a fairly daunting remit. But I think that I can say with some uh, confidence that we have uh, people representing most all of the fields that you mentioned uh, here today with us. I really appreciate your time, Michael. Thanks an awful lot for coming along. And uh, thank you. during this, this moment of transition, uh, I especially want to thank everybody at Interplanetary Initiative who's uh, organized this for us today, especially Taryn Strzok, who's been an amazing events coordinator for us. Now, in order to make this uh, virtual convening a little bit more like uh, the kind of convening um, that we've had in the past in person, I want to make a couple of announcements of new programs that I think are exciting and maybe of interest um, to people who are here with us. And so first I want to announce our Open Citizen Project. Um, ASU's Learning Enterprise, which is the arm of the university dedicated to lifelong learners, and Beagle Learning, which provides end-to-end -end programs for running real-world learning experiences, and Interplanetary Initiative are partnering to create the Open Citizen Project. Uh, open Citizen is a program structure in which groups use an open inquiry process to identify local needs or learning topics, research them, create a plan, and follow through to take meaningful action. Participants practice working in small teams to unite many disciplines, they develop workforce readiness skills, and they make positive change in the world. Our aim is to empower local groups to identify and solve the problems before them, democratize the scientific process, and create a global network of problem solvers. And we're marrying this process structure with ASU credentialing and the possibility of, of university credit. Our pilot uh, Open Citizen Partners are Michael Littig from Zuckerberg Institute, 
uh, ASU's Ten Across and ASU Office of Applied Innovation, Mesa Public Schools, Edmonds College, CSU Fresno, Illinois State, and WSU Tech. And so if you are interested in launching an open citizen team or learning more about our learner led uh, structure, please reach out to Catherine McConaughey at the email on the screen or contact anyone at Interplanetary Initiative or Beagle Learning. And finally, we plan to have an in person open citizen gathering this fall where, where we will practice the process and begin to build a further worldwide network of connected open citizen teams. So that is our first um, announcement of a new program for today. And then the second, uh, I'm, I'm very, very excited um, to announce XPRIZE and ASU Interplanetary Initiative are joining forces to, uh, create, uh, to create support to launch the Open Futures Alliance. This is a global cross-sector, cross-industry coalition combining the power of collaboration and shared innovation to build more just and equitable space futures. By working together and sharing ideas, identifying areas of need and offering resources, the Space Futures Alliance will help accelerate promising and vetted solutions to open space for all. So our objectives uh, with uh, the Space Futures Alliance are to um, convene a global coalition of corporations and organizations and startups and universities to collaborate that is to share ideas and research and resources and data to initiate and really to turbocharge concept validation and projects to compete and solve identify and participate in prize challenges and initiatives that incentivize uh, key breakthroughs and finally to scale to scale the outcome of promising solutions and you may notice there's a bit of a parallel between the the uh, space futures alliance an open citizen in that in, in both cases, and in fact, in all cases, what we're interested in doing is accelerating toward outcomes, not just having conversations. We want to build the network and accelerate toward outcomes. So XPRIZE is going to bring their infrastructure and resources and convening power to facilitate collaboration and launch challenges and competitions and promote data collaborations, common research endeavors. Um, the first step toward promotion of this alliance will begin this summer through the fall as part of this soft launch, um, as a part of XPRIZE's global visioneering by convening a who's who of space stakeholders to discuss and recommend the next generation of space-related XPRIZES while fundraising critically for the broader effort of launching the alliance. And so this is a soft launch heading straight to visioneering and then uh, fundraising for the alliance. We hope that we will gain enough financial support for the official launch of the Space Futures Alliance in early 2022. These efforts are led by a brain trust chaired by Anusha Ansari and George Whitesides and myself. And we are joined by Pete Warden, Chris Hadfield, Bob Smith, Jeffrey Mamber, Chris Lewicki, Tori Bruno, and Atosha Kay with more to come. And so let me uh, stop sharing for a moment and invite Amir Banifatemi to introduce himself and say a few words. Thank you very much, Lindy. Um, my name is Amir Banifatemi. I'm Chief Innovation Officer at XPRIZE, and this is a great pleasure to share with you the start of this program and this alliance that we're working together with, uh, with the ASU Interplanetary Initiative. The goal, as Lindy mentioned, is really to identify collectively grand projects and initiatives that we can launch either in form of a competition or prize, but also in terms of data collaboration or other initiatives that we may identify. The goal really is to be action oriented and to put our collective learning knowledge uh, and brain uh, effort into identifying scenarios where we can open space for everyone. And open space for everyone has a longer, longer meaning, but we are uh, focusing on finding pathways to do that. And as, as you suggested, Lindy, yourself, this summer we're working together to identify some moonshot ideas that could be brought to the crowd and incentivize the crowd to come forward and propose solutions and scenarios this collective effort that we're launching together will also support those efforts and try to identify more knowledge sharing and more opportunities to share our common understanding and blueprints and playbooks for the larger community. And this is gonna be really the beginning of a long journey and uh, very happy to be here today to at least uh, mention this to all of you. And um, yeah, we're gonna hear more about it uh, this fall as well. Thank you very much, Cindy. Amir, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to work on this with you and we're very excited. We think that a key toward 
making a really uh, equitable and, uh, and complete space future is in fact having more voices and a larger network. And that's really what we're succeeding in doing today. So thank you so much. We're really looking forward to this. Um, now I am thrilled to introduce my very great friend, Tracy Drain, who's gonna give our keynote. Um, she's a systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And she holds a bachelor's from the University of Kentucky and a master's from Georgia Institute of Technology, both in the fields of mechanical engineering. So she is, she is the hardcore aerospace mechanical engineer. In her 20 years at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, she's been involved in the development and testing and operation of five different missions. And her roles on these projects have included transition phase lead and lead systems engineer uh, in operations for the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, and also uh, mission readiness lead for Kepler, which was an exoplanet hunter, deputy chief engineer in operations for Juno, which is an, op an orbiter at Juno, and deputy project systems engineer for Psyche, obviously dear to my heart. And we were so <laughs> excited to work with Tracy on Psyche mission. And then she received a fantastic offer to become lead flight systems engineer for the Europa Clipper flagship mission to Jupiter's most intriguing icy moon. And so, uh, Tracy, I'm so thrilled to have you here to tell us today about space exploration from your seat as a really super expert here. So, so please um, take it away and people add questions in the Q&A if you have them and we will uh, reserve the last 10 minutes for sure for answering questions. Thank you, Lindy, appreciate the introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and then start the presentation. If I get this going, can I have you confirm that you can see this okay, Lynn? Yep, five by five. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, it is my very great pleasure to be here with you guys today and to give you a little bit about my thoughts and my experiences on the exploration that I've been able to participate in. I cannot tell you how excited I am about being a part of the interplanetary initiative and all the amazing visionary things that this group of fantastic folks are doing. And I'll start by saying a little bit about my own personal history of how I got interested in space. I'm sure this is going to echo a lot of the experience of many of the people that we have on the phone. When I was around 14 years old or so, I was involved in this program where they took a bunch of kids from various high schools around the University of Kentucky and took us out to college campuses over the summer. It was part of a Governor Scholar program in order to get exposed to the college life. And we got to choose our own, quote, major, unquote, and I chose astronomy. And they took us astronomy kids out into um, a really kind of deserted area at nighttime. And once our eyes got adjusted, I, even though I had been interested in space a little bit since I was a kid, I could not believe you could actually see the Milky Way with your own eyes. I was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, which is not one of the biggest cities in the, in the country, but it's certainly big enough to have enough light pollution that I, I didn't actually know that was a thing. And I remember just feeling this expansiveness about being a part of the galaxy that you could see with your own eyes. And while we were there, they also had us build these little telescopes. This is not an image that I took, this one I stole from the internet about what Jupiter looks like as seen through around a, a five inch telescope. And for me, being out there with a bunch of other high school students with our astronomy professor for that summer, getting an opportunity to see in real time one of the planets in our solar system through a telescope was also a very paradigm shifting moment for me. Even though I mean, this, this kind of image is not as beautiful as you can see with the close-ups that we had had from flyby missions in the past, but the notion that light from the sun had hit this planet and then bounced out into my eye through this telescope made the solar system feel like a much more cozy place, like these things are actually right there in your own backyard that are not that far away. And lots of other things inspired me when I was younger, as I'm sure again that it did with most of you. My lovely mom, who encouraged me in all my endeavors, bought us these child craft books. Some of you guys might remember these to go along with our encyclopedias. And this particular one had the story in it of how the solar system was formed. And I remember being much younger, eight or nine years old, and being fascinated with the idea that scientists could look around at the clues that we see today and be able to piece together a story of what must have happened four and a half billion years ago. I was also very, very inspired by lots of science fiction. I took Asimov, um, Arthur C. Clarke, some of my favorite hard sci-fi um, artists or authors. 
And my mom, even though she was not a very technical person, was extremely interested in sci-fi. So we watched a lot of shows growing up with her. Um, Star Trek, obviously, from these images here, Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica. And when I was trying to think about what to do for a career in space, I really wanted to have something to do with making the future look more like what we see in these shows today. And I think I was, I was really really pleased to hear Michael Crow's remarks earlier talking about this vision of revamping what we're doing with universities and how we work with students in order to deepen their knowledge and get them involved in the world in a much more practical way. It makes me want to go back and repeat my university years too in order to continue thinking about these big visions and participating in them as a student and learning how you can influence the world going forward. So as Wendy mentioned uh, in that lovely introduction, in my 20 years at the lab, I've had really great opportunities to do some exploring of our solar system neighborhood and beyond. I was able to spend about six years on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter where I felt like I really learned the ins and outs of how at least we at NASA partnering with institutions like Lockheed Martin and, and Ball Aerospace and Maxar and other companies and some of the missions I've been involved in go about putting together these very complex science targeted deep space missions that we do. One of the things that I love about the Interplan Interplanetary Initiative's vision is this partnership of government and universities and private companies because on a smaller scale on these one-off missions, we do a lot of that. It takes a village to put one of these spacecraft together. We partner with private industry for system contracts a lot of the time. We have university institutes partnering with companies in order to build instruments. We have partnerships with people in terms of doing data analysis. There's a lot going on in these one-offs and it's really cool to me to think about how that gets expanded into our exploration of space. Um, I was part of the, the, uh, a group earlier that talked about doing infrastructure development. So really cool to see how all that is developing. In my time, I've gotten to work on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter Kepler, which is not going anywhere, but spent several years looking for exoplanets and kind of revolutionized our understanding about the commonality of planets in our galaxy. And it was one of the missions that has fed forward into missions like TESS, which are continuing to expand humanity's knowledge about exoplanets. Juno, which launched in 2011 and has been orbiting the biggest planet in our solar system since 2016. I'm gonna talk a bit more about that mission in this talk. Psyche, which is still near and dear to my heart, even though I only spent two years on that mission, I'm happily keeping an eye on its progress towards the 2022 launch date. Very excited to see what we learn of that asteroid when it gets there. And now Europa Clipper, which I joined last year in our run-up to critical design review, is on target for a launch in the fall of 2024. It's going to go back to the Jovian system, but with an emphasis on that really amazing moon of Jupiter so that we can learn more about it there. I'll also be talking about this mission in this presentation. A lot that I've jammed together into 20 minutes, but we'll see if I can at least hit the highlights and give you a sense of the cool things that have been going on. So I know a lot of you are very familiar with the way that we go about doing deep space missions, but just a quick step through for some folks on the phone who might not be as dialed in, the flight project design cycle for these deep space missions goes something like this. You start off with science questions. Um, what is it that we want to learn about a body, about some aspect of the solar system or the universe? And then the scientists partner with engineers to come up with a mission design. How do we get the data that is necessary for the scientists to answer those questions? Can we do it by using assets here on Earth and pointing them at the target? Can we get enough information in a flyby? Do we need to go somewhere and orbit? And then as the mission design is coming together, that helps inform what we need to do for a spacecraft design in order to support the instruments to go where we need to go or point them where they need to be pointed in order to gather the data. And as we have that detailed design that's coming together, we start going through the process of building prototypes. And then deeper into that process, we start assembling a spacecraft and we test and test and test and test it some more because once you launch it, you can't go out there and replace any pieces of hardware that aren't working anymore. And then it's on its way to its destination in, the period, in a phase called operations. And then operations last from your cruise period if you're going to some specific destination like Juno and Clipper out to the Jovian system through the whole gathering of science data. And hopefully when missions are successful and still have some lifetime into extended missions, 
as we're bringing back the data sets that the scientists can use to then get at the heart of the questions, which are the reason we send these spacecraft out there in the first place. So I'm actually going to spend a little bit of time talking about the whys of why we sent Juno out to Jupiter, and then again, why, we, why we're sending uh, Clipper out to Europa. So before Juno, there were some things that we knew about Jupiter, lots of things we knew about Jupiter because of previous missions that had been there in the past. We knew that Jupiter has literally dozens of moons here, the four largest that were discovered by Galileo, um, Europa, Io, Ganymede, and Callisto. We know that Jupiter is a giant gas planet. You can fit about 11 Earths across the middle. It is mostly made of hydrogen and helium. And I'll, I'll say a little bit on the next page that because it is so huge, the pressures of gravity are so strong that you get very, very high temperatures and pressures inside the planet, which then compresses that hydrogen into a liquid. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that does to the environment around the planet. We know that it has these storms, especially the Great Red Spot that has been there as long as we've had instruments powerful enough to be able to see it. And it's actually been shrinking quite a bit over the last few decades. Jupiter also has rings. They're not these magnificent, easily visible to the naked eye rings as we have with Saturn, but they're there and they're shepherded by little moons as the rings around Saturn are as well. So I talked a little bit about how, as you get deeper into the planet Jupiter, um, scientists believe that the hydrogen gets compressed into a layer of liquid metallic hydrogen. Some of the questions that Juno had are, you know, what is the, is there, what is the deep interior of the planet like? Is there a core? How big is the core? They wanted to understand this radiation field and magnetic field around Jupiter that compressed liquid hydrogen, you get deep enough into the planet, the temperatures and pressures get so high that the little electrons around the hydrogen atoms get stripped off and are free to flow in there. You've got this free flowing electrons, which generates an electrical field. And even though Jupiter is so much bigger than the earth, about 11 times across again, as the earth rotates once and every 24 hours, Jupiter rotates once in about every 10 hours. You have this rapidly rotating electrical field, which generates a monstrous magnetic field. And those magnetic field lines trap charged particles coming from the solar wind and other places and accelerate them to near relativistic speeds. speeds. And that generates this pretty immense radiation field around the planet. I like to think of Jupiter as a planet sitting in a donut hole of radiation. And the scientists want to understand more about this magnetic field, do a mapping of the magnetic field, understand more about the, the radiation field around Jupiter. And that's also something that we had to take into account pretty pretty strongly as we were developing the spacecraft design to go and visit this planet. Some of the other things scientists were interested in are how deep the storms go that are on the surface. Are they shallow? Do they go very deep? Scientists wanted to understand what the, what the water content is of the planet because that was a discriminator between some of the different potential theories of formation from Jupiter. Lots of things that we're interested in learning about this planet. So in order to get out there and get the information for the scientists with their instruments, we developed Juno, the spacecraft. There were some pretty key engineering challenges that the design had to meet. I've mentioned the radiation at Jupiter. We were able to deal with that partially by a mission design, I'll actually go back a slide, that did not keep the spacecraft down inside this high radiation period for long periods of time. We had this very elliptical orbit where we spend much of our time out away from the planet and then as we come by to collect the science data, we try to go inside this donut hole and miss most of the high radiation and then back out again and come back around and do that on multiple orbits. Our original mission design had us doing that once every 14 days. Ultimately, for various and sundry reasons, the orbit wound up in a 53 and a half day orbit when we gather our science data in a couple of hours spent closest to the planet. That only knocks the radiation down so much though, and the spacecraft would still see a pretty significant dose over its lifetime. And so there's a radiation vault made of titanium where the sensitive electronics live tucked up under the high gain antenna. Jupiter is also very far away from the sun, about five times farther away from the sun than the earth is. And so we need very large solar arrays. I'll show you a an illustration near the end of this package on how large they are. Even though the whole spacecraft is about 65 feet across, the arrays generate about 530 watts of power all the way out at Jupiter. We're also very far away from the Earth, so we need a large high gain antenna in order to communicate at high data rates. And to slow down enough to get into orbit, Juno has a main engine on the back of the spacecraft that we burned for about 35 minutes on July 4th, 2016, in order to get captured 
into that 53 and a half day orbit. We have a suite of instruments on Juno that are there in order to study things like um, the gravitational field. We actually use our telecom antenna and slight variations in Doppler signal in order to kind of get a sense of the interior of the planet. There's a magnetometer out on a boom to get it away from the magnetic fields generated by the spacecraft that study and map that magnetic field. I'll say a little bit about the microwave radiometer and what we've been able to see with that. Um, JunoCam, which takes some very beautiful color images, and also this Jovian infrared auroral mapper that I'll have a picture of as well. And um, we'll be talking about all the details of the instruments because we don't have that kind of done, but there's lots of fun information out online for you to go find to learn more about it. So a few of the Juno discoveries, some of my favorite images are those of the poles because the spacecraft that had visited Jupiter before either flew by the equator or orbited at the equator like Galileo did. And so we literally did not know what the poles looked like. Juno is a polar orbiter, so we get lovely images of the pole every time it goes around. And I think it's just kind of amazing that up near the poles, what you see is, this, this image is a little color stretch, but it is a bit more purple and blue there. And we see kind of this soup of storms going on. One of my more favorite images is from the Jovian Auroral Infrared Mapper, where it takes images that are not true color, where it's darker, it's a bit cooler, where it's brighter, it's a bit warmer. And this structure was what we saw on the North Pole of Jupiter. It had these eight almost equally spaced storms. Someone has played with this image to make it a little bit animated, but um, it's nothing that I expected to see there. And I don't think anyone on the science team had predicted that either. I, was, I got to be a fly in the room and we had our first science meeting where the GERM team put an image like this up and the whole room burst into applause. It was kind of beautiful to be on the forefront of that information um, coming back. We also have done a couple of flybys of the Great Red Spot, and this is a nice compilation showing an image from JunoCam and also data from the microwave radiometer, where the scientists were able to confirm now that down as deep as that instrument is able to penetrate, we can see differences across the planet going across the, the Great Red Spot, where it's um, warmer on one side and cooler on the other. So the roots of those storms do go pretty deep. They're not just shallow surface storms, shallow um, cloud top storms. Another really cool destination, no pun intended, in the Jovian neighborhood is this lovely moon of Europa. And to go back a little bit in history about the moons of Jupiter and Europa in particular, when Galileo was observing Jupiter through his telescope in 1610, he saw these bright spots around Jupiter, which he initially thought were stars. But on successive nights, those changed position relative to Jupiter, and he realized that they were actually moons orbiting Jupiter, like our Earth goes around the sun, like our moon orbits us. And those moons we now know are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, um, which were studied along with Jupiter by the Galileo spacecraft when it orbited from uh, up until 2003. So Europa's surface is really interesting because unlike our moon and other moons, it does not have a large number of craters. You can see examples of craters, including this really large one near the Southern Hemisphere, but there's something going on on the surface that is causing it to be refreshed. And so old craters have been filled in. That's one of the evidence that there must be um, perhaps water that's coming up to the surface and refreshing it from time to time, um, geologically speaking. There's these rigid plains, there's chaos terrain, there's these interesting little freckle-like lenticulae all sorts of interesting things that scientists want to study and understand what's causing that morphology. Um, most in interesting is what Europa's interior might be like. And I'll talk a little in a couple of slides why scientists think this is so. But scientists believe that under this thick shell of ice, there is actually a large amount of liquid water on Europa. And then as you go deeper in, you get to a rocky mantle and there's perhaps some kind of iron core. And the amount of water that scientists think is there is, is pretty enormous, like more water than all of the Earth's oceans combined times two. And so some of the questions that are out there is, are all the conditions for life as we know it there on Europa? So why do scientists think that there is water there? Um, the biggest clue came from Galileo in terms of its measurements of the magnetic field around Jupiter. There's a when Galileo was studying the magnetic fields around Jupiter, it determined that the magnetic field lines are bent at Europa. And the, the 
thought from scientists is that something, the same thing is going on there as is going on with the earth. At the earth, the salty oceans as the tides go in and out cause perturbations in the earth's magnetic field. And so it's believed that these perturbations in Jupiter's magnetic field around Europa are due to some large quantity of briny liquid there on the moon, presumably, um, water with salts dissolved in it underneath the ice. And the next question then is, well, Jupiter is five times farther away from the sun is, it's really cold out there. What could be going on to produce enough heat to keep the liquid water under the ice? And the thought there is that the moon's orbit around, you, around Jupiter is not perfectly circular, it's slightly elliptical. And when the moon is farther away from Jupiter, there's less of a tug from gravity. When it's closer to Jupiter, there's more of a tug. And so essentially you get this stronger pull, lesser pull, which creates this friction within the moon, generating enough heat to keep a lot of water melted under the surface of So are there all the ingredients for life there at Europa? Well, we know there's a lot of water. Um, we know that there are essential elements. Um, one of the things that Europa Clipper is gonna be trying to, to find out, at least from studying the surface, is what the surface composition is. Essential elements perhaps there from the time of its formation and also impacts of comets and other bodies over the solar system's history. There's chemical energy. We talked about the stretching and, and um, lesser and more stretching on the moon that can be causing heating. And the idea is that similar to on Earth, down below the oceans, all the way at the ocean floor, you get these hydrothermal vents from heat venting inside the planet, creating these oases of warm water, where at least on Earth, we know that way down beneath the surface where sunlight does not reach, that provides enough of an energy driver in order to sustain a wide variety of life and these large colonies of life down around hydrothermal vents. So maybe that sort of thing could be happening at Europa. We know that it's been stable. It's, it's been in these conditions and kind of simmering for 4 billion years. It's a very exciting possibility that maybe all the ingredients for life exist there and some kind of life has formed under the ocean. We'd really love to find that out. So with the Europa Clipper mission, and I'll show you a little bit about the spacecraft in a minute, the way that it's gonna study Europa is by doing multiple satellite gravity assists of Europa from orbit around Jupiter. We put the spacecraft in orbit at Jupiter. We do flybys of Europa in order to tweak the trajectory so that we can then get another flyby and another. The current mission design consists of about 50 low altitude Europa flybys in a little under four years. And the altitude varies from between a maximum of around 2,700 kilometers to as far down as 25 kilometers. And when I first became involved in the mission, I was kind of wondering if we had missed a zero <laughs> somewhere there. 25 seems very, very low to me. Um, in my time on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, you get really fantastic high resolution images from the surface and about 10 times that altitude. So it's amazing to me that we're gonna have a handful of our flybys that are gonna be quite that low. And doing this, like we did with Juno, is gonna minimize our time in the high radiation environment. Europa is kind of in that nice little radiation donut around Jupiter, so Europa Clipper has to handle a much higher radiation dose than Juno, the spacecraft did. But we still try to minimize that by spending um, a small amount of time inside the radiation belts when we're doing the flybys and then spending most of the time in our 14-day pedal outside of that radiation donut. So this gives you a sense of the Europa Clipper spacecraft. We had a lot of similar challenges to Jupiter. We had radiation um, at Jupiter and Europa, much higher radiation than Juno had. And in order to deal with that, we also have a radiation vault um, tucked under the high gain antenna and another mini, actually it's tucked under here under the avionics um, module and a mini radiation antenna where some of the telecom components live long Jupiter range to the sun again. So we have very, very large solar arrays on the spacecraft. I'll show you an image, I think on the next slide about how big those arrays are. A long range to the earth, so we've got a high gain antenna as well as many other antennas that we use when we can't point the spacecraft accurately enough to rely on that one. And we also have to slow the spacecraft down in order to get into orbit around Jupiter. Unlike Juno, this mission does not have a single large main engine but we use the collection of reaction control system thrusters in order to slow down. And that means that instead of a 35 minute burn that we had with a high impulse engine on Juno, this mission is gonna be about six and a half hours burn in order to slow down and get captured into orbit. 
So solar at Jupiter, uh, Juno was the very first spacecraft to go quite that far away and use solar. I think you guys all understand how the sunlight spreads out as you get farther and farther away from the sun, with Jupiter being a little over five times farther away from the sun, we get a little less than 125th of a sunlight out there. And so both of these spacecrafts have to be pretty sizable in order to collect enough light from the sun and turn it into energy that the spacecraft can use. They also both have pretty significant batteries in order to be able to store energy for when the arrays are not pointed at the sun. For Juno, the mission design had the spacecraft going around Jupiter in such a way that originally there was never going to be an eclipse at Jupiter, but there were times such as JOI when we had to turn the spacecraft and put the arrays 90 degrees on sun and then rely entirely on battery power. Juno was designed to live for about two hours fully on battery power and supply the energy needed to all of the spacecraft components and the instruments. For Europa Clipper, we do have eclipses built into the mission, really long eclipses, like nine hour eclipses. And so the batteries have to have quite a lot of storage capacity in order to be able to deal with that. This is actually one of the first missions, the first mission that I've ever been on where the driving power and energy case is not launched, but it's actually those super long eclipses out at Jupiter. Europa Clipper is festooned with a large suite of instruments in order to be able to gather all the science data that the scientists need in order to answer the questions that we have about Europa Clipper. I'll just mention a couple of them. We have a magnetometer uh, in order to sense those ocean properties. We have an ice penetrating radar, which is gonna let scientists try to get a sense of how thick this ice shell is. Estimates are on the order of 25 kilometers. Maybe the ocean depth is on the order of 60 to 100 and some odd kilometers, but those are the things that we're trying to understand with this mission. We have a spectrometer on board in order to determine the, the composition of the particles we may see as we're going around the moon, and also a spectrograph to get a sense of the surface and any potential plume composition. There's a thermal imager in, in order to let us look for hot spots, which might be places where the ice is a little thinner, um, and, a, and a variety of instruments to do um, other types of scientific exploration. So Europa Clipper, we, again, I mentioned earlier, got through our critical design review in the December of last year. And we're now well on our way of finalizing some elements of the design, getting into the uh, assembly and test phase of the mission starting next spring. And that was the end of my presentation. Any questions from folks? This is Tracy is fantastic. I'm getting a I'm getting a lot of people like emailing me on the side how much they're enjoying this. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So we do have we have a question in the QA, but I want to start with um, another question for you, which is uh, just kind of warm us up for this. I, I really think that systems engineering, the thing that you are leading on Clipper, is one of the major evolutionary um, achievements of humankind because it allows us to build something that works without fail, but it's so complicated that no single person working on building it understands the whole thing. And I wonder, can you just say a few words about how that is achieved? Like, what are the processes that allow people to work together at that level of fidelity? Because I want us to start doing that for everything here on Earth. So, so how do we do it? <laughs> Oh, that's such a great question. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, one of the things that we're doing right now on Europa Clipper is, is going through a mind melding exercise as we're heading deeper into our verification and validation campaign about not just systems engineering, but how we all work together and how we all make sure that we're communicating all the things in order to understand everything we're gonna be analyzing and testing as we go forward. And, and I'll say it this way, a spacecraft is a very complex piece. You've got power, telecom, thermal, software, like all the things that have to work well together in order to accomplish the mission goal. And there are experts in those various areas and like all the way down until you get to, you know, subsystem component level. And there's so many details that each person needs to know about their area that you, you literally cannot know all of the different areas. And so a subsystem or a system engineer's role is to understand enough about those things and to have a, a good process of thinking about things at the big picture level so that when we have a design question, when we have an anomaly that happens in flight, we know to get the right people in the room, ask the right probing questions that will get people thinking along, okay, what is it that we're trying to do? What are our options? What are the pros and cons associated with them? And some of the key things that I think are important there are ones that it sounds like we're trying to nurture in university settings right now. 
it's important for systems engineers to be able to absorb new information and be able to attach it to the information we know and adjust what we understand about things so that we can be evolving solutions and helping the other people on our team do that. And that's kind of one of those learning how to learn practices that can be hard to teach people in a, in a school environment without some practical experience. And it's also about listening very closely to what it is that people have to say so that you don't have this confirmation bias mm. about what you think the answer is. Right. And instead of right. taking in all the things that you come up with the right answer. So lots, lots and lots about a communication and about making sure that you are not just articulating in real time, but capturing the things that were discussed in a way that makes it easy for people to later go back and see and understand and then apply to the things that we're doing going forward. So, right. And, and so this was a, this is a skill that I've, I've come to appreciate more and more through working on Psyche, which we've now been working on for a decade, uh, and we're launching in 15 months. And, um, and so a follow on question before I move to the Q&A, we've got some good questions in Q&A. I watched you use your communication skills in meetings. Sorry, I'm making this personal because this is totally like, I just, I think you're really, really good at this. And I've watched lots and lots of people run meetings and meetings where we're talking about things like engineering anomalies or challenges people can't explain. And the, the like the final mile, the last like untapped kilometer of, of closing a question is actually literally understanding what's in another person's head. And that requires like some level of relaxation and willingness to share. And, and I, I think there's a lot of people who would like to believe that engineering is just you sit by yourself in the lab with your soldering iron. <laughs> but in the end, it's what happens at those meetings. And so and so before we turn to the to the Q&A and please keep adding your questions in there because we've got time. Um, Tracy, can you share some of, the, of your techniques for how in those meetings when you're trying to get to the bottom of something and maybe someone is actually kind of to blame, but that's not where you want to go, you want to keep them communicating. And how do you run meetings like that? Yeah, I think the way that there, there's two techniques that I use um, I'm, and I'm making that maybe there's 50 of them, but two come to mind right now. <laughs> and one of them is uh, <laughs> the exploratory questions in a way that is not accusatory or aggressive. And I think the way that I tend to phrase those questions is trying to put myself in the person's shoes and think about, like, I know they had a good reason for doing that. And so my question isn't this, why did you do that? But it is a, can you help me understand this approach and how it does not do this bad thing and how it gets to this good thing? And, and it's a way of, of, by subtext, giving people an idea that like, I trust you know what you're doing, but just fill me in because I'm not on your same page yet. Uh, yeah, and yeah. that seems to make the other people relax and be able to, to speak. And I think that one of the things that can be contentious, this might not be an answer to your question, but I think it's important to get out there anyway, is that when we're trying to come up with options to resolve anomalies, people can get emotionally invested in their favorite one, sometimes because they think that is the right one and we literally are trying to not destroy the spacecraft. <laughs> and so people can get a little hot under their collar if everyone isn't understanding and agreeing with their idea. And I've determined over the years that some of the angst that comes along with that is that people don't feel like other folks are listening and that you don't agree with their idea, not because it's not the best idea, but because you just haven't heard it. And so if we go around the room and we're talking options, you can hear people keep going back to their favorite one again and again. And I've discovered that if you can listen deeply enough to capture all their nuances and then build a trade matrix that says, here's options one, two, three, four, five, here are the key things we're trying to do with it. And then like write in all the pros and cons and color things yellow and red. That will tamp down a lot of that because people can see their idea captured on paper. They know yes. that you've got it and yes. they can see it compared against the other items that are out there. And so when we land on one that isn't theirs, it's okay because they've, they've seen the whole landscape and everyone's able to just recognize that big picture. And it's, it's it. continually surprising to me how that isn't everyone's instinctive reaction to solving problems like that because I've been so embedded in it for so many years that I'm like, just build me a table. <laughs> like, I promise it's going to help. Yeah, so there are definitely people who still think that shouting is a better way to uh, reach consensus and make everyone feel heard. <laughs> so that's, those are great answers. Um, so question uh, uh, in the Q&A. For Clipper, how will the magnetometer expand our knowledge of Europa's ocean? How does a magnetometer help us understand a water ocean? Yeah, and my understanding of it, and this is, this is where I'll give you my disclaimer that me, engineer, and not scientist, but the, what I have absorbed from listening to our scientists is that it, it's that perturbation in Jupiter's magnetic field and how much it's perturbed and what the pattern looks like around the moon that they can use to give them clues about at least the existence of the water beneath the surface. And, and maybe, I'm making this part up now, based on what I learned about uh, that and its tie to the tides, 
what what it is moving around in there, bro, just ask, whatever, I'm making that part up. But I think that that paired with the ice penetrating radar are the things that are going to give us the most clues about the water ocean under the ice. Right, right. It's a really great question. How do you actually measure a water ocean when you can't go touch it? Yeah. So, so what are your thoughts about Enceladus versus Europa as a potential mm. life finding mission destination? And I, I would encourage you to answer this, not just like as an astrobiologist, but also as an engineer, like what's your Enceladus yeah. versus Europa? That's great, since I am not an astrobiologist. <laughs> I think uh, one of the things that's exciting about Enceladus is, is the recent, very detailed evidence that there are plumes there, right? Like, wow, there's water coming out of that sucker. And so there is evidence that there's that tie between the sub ice um, ocean and the surface. And just, it gives us opportunities to be able to explore the ocean by studying the water that's coming out of the plume. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, I think there's also evidence that there are plumes on Europa, but we'll hopefully see more detailed evidence oh once God. we get the spacecraft in orbit around Europa. Um, when it comes to, like I personally don't know, and I don't know if anyone knows, um, but Google search might give us some information about the potential temperature of the water at Enceladus versus the temperature of the water at Jupiter. I mean, I think that, again, the, the main source of energy to keep the water liquid is coming from inside the moon and not just from the, the sunlight that's coming on the surface. And so maybe it doesn't matter that Enceladus, that Saturn is so much farther away than right. in uh, Europa is. But those are the couple of things that I think about. Anyway, I think they're yeah. both super, very fascinating places. And I'm glad that we're trying to study them both. I really hope that Europa has plumes. That would be so amazing. So, so, so for those of you who are not just like wild icy moon uh, astrobiology aficionados, which I know we have some people here who are, um, <laughs> imagine if at the bottom of the liquid Europa ocean, there is that rocky core, which is still active, maybe from radiogenic heating. And so you have something like those mid-ocean ridge vents that Tracy showed. So there's microbes living down there maybe giant squid, you know, you saw it on Hollywood first. Um, but if there is a, a, a geyser uh, leaving the ocean, leaving the icy shell and going into space where the spacecraft can literally intercept with its dust, maybe we would find little fragments that indicate the life inside. So that's part of the reason why geysers are so exciting. Amazing. So um, what would be, all right, so here we are, we haven't even launched Clipper yet. Giant <laughs> engineering challenge, doing great, on track, What's the next step after Clipper? What's the next mission? What do we do? The next mission that I am really excited to hear about is the Europa lander mission, because it's one thing to try to study what's going on in that moon from orbit. It's quite another thing to have boots on the ground, as it were, uh, robotically, in order to really sample the ice and, and explore what we can actually see. One of the things that I remember very vividly from my early years at JPL was, I think I was just out for lunch and walked past some people who were talking about potential ideas for getting down beneath the ice and like going down to sample the water and talking yes. about analogs like like Vladivostok and Russia and things that people are thinking about like how do you go and explore uh, an environment that you want to keep incredibly pristine because if there is the possibility that there is life that's developed there, you certainly don't want to contaminate it with any of our earth junk, um, not just for scientific reasons, but just because <laughs> it seems yeah, like being poor right. neighbors, right? And so I'm, I'm excited about those prospects, just a lander period. And then at some point, much deeper in the future, because 25 kilometers is a lot of ice to get through um, to figure out how to explore the, the sub ice ocean. Fantastic. Yeah, I, know, I think a whole bunch of us would just really love to see a lander. Those engineering challenges are gigantic. Um, so following on to uh, the idea of using systems engineering in other areas instead of, you know, I mean, there's very little that humans do that is as complicated and demanding as creating a deep space spacecraft that needs to work for many, many years without repair. But imagine we wanted to take some of these mad skills. Um, what are some starting points that you recommend or maybe that you've even used to, to bring systems engineering into research or academia or endeavors here on Earth? Yeah, that's such a great question because, you know, in working with students who are trying to do projects for school, there are so many pressures on them in terms of constraints they have to work with. They only have so much limited time. They're doing those projects while they're doing 23 other things, including all their classrooms. And so 
I was guilty of this like 20 some odd years ago, you fall into the habit of just like, what is the quickest way I can get this thing done and then move on to my next thing, as opposed to trying to bring some systematic rigor to what you're doing. We had, there's this phrase of just like throwing things at the wall to see what sticks. Oh, let's try this. Let's try that. And then not thinking about the consequences. (laughs) And so I think that the idea of trade studies, like teaching students, like what is that? It's trying to get your arms around. Here's the thing I'm trying to achieve. And, and let's brainstorm for a while. Here are a bunch of different options. Okay, let's take those options and think about the pros and cons associated with each one based on what we're trying to do. And then from there, narrow in on uh, initial starting point of a design. I think that thought process is something that can be applied to things that students do. And that can also be applied to things that we do. Like hilariously, we were remodeling our house during the pandemic. And there were so many things we were trying to figure out how to do at the same time. Like when, when do you get the windows replaced versus painting the house and like doing the floor and, and repairing the this and like it was a hot mess. And so at some point I turned to my husband, and I go, you know what we need? <laughs> we need a trade study matrix. <laughs> and I put together the flow diagram of all the things and when they needed to happen and when inspector should happen. And he's like, wow, that's really useful. Is that what you do? <laughs> is that what you do, Tracy yes, Train? Is that what you do all day is draw tables? <laughs> <laughs> And so it was kind of hilarious because after being married for like over 15 years, he was like, that's how you apply a systems engineering thought process to a complicated thing where there's a bunch of moving parts and schedule and constraints that you're trying to keep straight. It was hilarious. And there's a lot of things like that that we can apply to other aspects of our lives. I I so agree with that. And frankly, I, I hadn't quite thought about it this way, but this is really what we're trying to bring in our open citizen project process that we were talking about. Like a lot of people can think of a problem or a complaint and only a few really do the research and then only even fewer like really analyze that research and figure out what the right next steps are. And so that's a skill that I think we all need to work on. And that's one of the things we're trying to bring to that. Um, Let's see, we have a couple of good, more good questions, but maybe only time for one quick one, which um, let me ask you this one. Could you describe the challenge for spacecraft systems engineering to develop a lander before Clipper even sends in the high res surface images. Uh, So I know there's work going on already and you may know something about it. Can you comment on that? How do we prepare for the next thing before we're quite finished with this step? Yeah, and actually I'm gonna cheat and, and, and give you an example of Europa Clipper versus Juno because I know Clipper had a similar thing where we're trying to design an even more complex spacecraft that's gonna deal with even more radiation that's gonna orbit at these absurdly low altitudes of Europa Clipper. And we were doing a lot of the early design before Juno launched and got there in order to inform us some more about the environment. And so uh, I think the answer applies to both the development of Clipper and the development of a lander is that you you have to do your best so to gather the information that the scientists and the environmental space engineers know about where you're going and use those to fold into your process. And you just have to open up your parameters and have yeah. much more margin built in. You have to, you have to consider for a lander specifically, like how accurately you'll be able to land, what you can do with the images you have now in order to figure out places that are safer than others to land. Uh, We've learned a lot, even from things like um, the the Mars rover, Perseverance, that just landed with the whole terrain relative navigation and being able to use as you're coming in. And now you've got eyes on where you're landing. You're like, nope, not right there. (laughs) Let's move over. There are some things like that from other missions that can be applied to lander missions. I mean, it'll be harder because there's no atmosphere. (laughs) Right, without the atmosphere. I wish we had time to talk about radiation. Tracy, I want to thank you so much for coming today and giving this talk. And thank you all so much for coming. And uh, we look forward to further interplanetary initiative events in the future, and we will all be cheering for Clipper. Uh, Thank you, Tracy, you're fantastic. And thank you. Hence, thank you, you. never forget, thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Hope you have a great Friday.